Hey everybody, so these notes are an introduction to hypothesis testing. Now, a fair warning at the beginning of it, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary, uh, there's going to be a lot of different concepts that we're about to learn, but the good news is that there's not really going to be any actual math involved in this set of notes. All right, we're going to get to the math over the next few notes, but for this one, it's just understanding the concepts of what this is. All right, so consider this. You are driving down a highway and you come across a billboard for a new hybrid car. The billboard claims that the car gets a gas mileage of 50 miles per gallon. You're skeptical about this though, so you decide to find out. You study a sample of 30 of those cars and you find the mean mileage of the sample to be 47 miles per gallon with a sample standard deviation of 5.5 miles per gallon. Is this sample mean enough to indicate that the advertisement is false? All right, so this is the idea of hypothesis testing. We see something, we either think that that might be true or might be false, so we study a whole bunch of them and use what we find out to come to a not 100% certain decision, but to come to a conclusion of if it's most likely not true or most likely true. All right, so a hypothesis test is a process that uses sample statistics to test a claim about the value of a population parameter. So in this case, the 50 miles per gallon, that was the population parameter that it was claiming. We're using a sample of 30 cars and using the sample mean and the sample standard deviation to try to test whether that might be true or not. Right? A statement about a population parameter is called a statistical hypothesis. To be able to test a population parameter, you will need two hypotheses, one that shows the claim and one that is its complement or its opposite. These two hypotheses are, first off, we have the null hypothesis, which we denote with H sub zero. All right, so the null hypothesis is a hypothesis that contains a statement of equality. This can either be less than or equal to, equal to, or greater than or equal to. All right, the alternative hypothesis which we denote with H sub A, is the complement of the null hypothesis. All right? So if the null hypothesis is false, then the alternative hypothesis must be true. This one is either going to be less than, not equal to, or greater than. Right, it's always just going to be the opposite of the null hypothesis. All right. So, for example, the null and alternative hypothesis for the example above are so the example above was this one right here about driving down a highway and what our actual claim is is that the car gets a gas mileage of 50 miles per gallon. 
all right? That's a statement of equality. All right, because it gets 50 miles per gallon. It's not saying it gets more than that, not saying it gets less than that. It's saying it gets 50. All right, so since that's a statement of equality, that's going to be our null hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean, or mu, equals 50. Now, the alternative hypothesis is going to be that the mean does not equal 50. It's just the exact opposite of the null hypothesis. All right. Now, one thing about this, though, since the null hypothesis is always just the one that's equal to, it doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is always going to be our claim. Sometimes the claim doesn't necessarily say equal to. So I'm going to put claim to the right of the mu equal to 50, just so we remember that that one was actually our claim, and we'll see what to actually do with that later. All right. Now, right here is a big table. Don't be intimidated by it. This table is just here to make your life easier. All right. So on this table, what you're looking for is whenever in the problem it says the mean is, look at the words after that. All right. So when you find the words after that, like for example, in this case, it was the car gets gas mileage of 50 miles per gallon. That was our mean. So in that case, it was just K. All right, or of K. So whenever you find it on this table, this actually tells you exactly what your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are going to be. So for example, if you had a problem that said the mean is more than 20, you look on this table for more than 20, which would be right here because the K would be the 20. And then your hypotheses are going to look like this. You just replace the K with, in this case, 20, and you're done. All right, so this just helps you translate the words into math. Now, keep in mind, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other ways that it could be said. But this definitely gives you a lot of them, definitely gives you the most common ones. Uh, so more than likely, it's probably on this table. All right, so let's look at example one. For each scenario, state the null and alternative hypothesis and identify which represents the claim. Because remember, either one of them could be the claim. So a tech person reports that the mean lifetime for a new laptop before it breaks is at most 64 months. All right. So again, if you just look at your table, at most is right here. So we know it's going to look like this. So we're going to have our null hypothesis is going to be that the mean is less than or equal to k, all right, which in this case is 64. 
We have the alternative hypothesis is mu is greater than k, which again is 64. Now the at most 64, the way to write at most 64 is less than or equal to 64. So the one that says less than or equal to 64 is this one. So that's one that our claim is. All right, so we wrote both of them, but the null hypothesis in this case is our claim. All right, B. McDonald's states that it serves more than 65 million customers a day. So if we go back up here, we see more than. So again, we know it's going to be this one. So it's going to be the null hypothesis is mu is less than or equal to k, which in this case is 65 million. And the alternative hypothesis is mu is greater than 65 million. All right, now remember though, the claim was more than 65 million. All right, so if the claim is more than, that would be this one right here at the bottom. So this time our claim is the alternative hypothesis. All right, so even though we use the exact same inequalities for the null and alternative hypotheses, the claim was different on these first two examples. All right, part C. A school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activity is 61%. All right, so this time, we are going to, instead of using mu, because this one's not a mean, this one's just a actual statistic already, it's a percentage. So we're going to use p instead of mu, just to indicate that this was a percentage, this was a probability. All right, in this case, our h sub 0, or our null hypothesis, is p equals... 0.61, which is right as a decimal. And our alternative hypothesis is p is not equal to 0 0.61. All right, because just remember, in math, is means equals. So if it says is 61%, it means equals 0.61. Okay, so at this point, we just need to figure out our claim, but our claim that it is 61% means equals, so we want the one that's equals. So the null hypothesis is our claim. All right. Next up, another little block of vocabulary. So as we go through a hypothesis test, our goal at the end is to either reject the null hypothesis or to fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so those are the two options we're going to have at the end. We can either reject the null hypothesis 
or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right? Now, the thing is, when we do that, no matter what, we're not 100% that this is true or not true. We're not saying that the null hypothesis is definitely true or definitely false. All we're really saying is it's more likely to be true or more likely to be false. All right, but there's two things that can happen. So a type one error occurs when we reject the null hypothesis, but it was actually true. All right, so for example, we reject that McDonald's serves more than 65 million people a day. But it turns out that it's true. All right, T a type two error occurs when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but it was actually false. So for example, we fail to reject that 61% of students are involved in extracurricular activities at a school, but it turns out that it was false and it was only 50% of the students. All right, so in that case, it was an incorrect statistic, the 61 wasn't correct, but we just failed to say that we could definitely reject it. All right, so we said that we don't have enough data to reject it when we probably should have actually rejected it. So that's a type two error. All right, now, while we can't be 100% sure we can be close enough depending on the situation. All right, the level of significance is your maximum allowable probability of making a type one error. All right, we denote it by alpha. The smaller the alpha, the smaller the chance that we make a type one error. So we're gonna want alpha to be pretty small just because that means we have a small chance of getting it wrong. The probability of making a type two error is actually denoted by beta, but in this class, we're not really gonna talk about beta. Uh, we're mainly gonna be focusing on just the alpha. All right, so one more little piece of vocabulary and then I'm gonna end the video here and pick up in the next one. So in this class, we will be looking at hypothesis testing for the mean, which is mu. All right, our test statistic is the sample mean that is found which we denote usually by X bar. Right. To do that, we will be using either Z scores or T scores, depending on if we are given sigma or not. So just like we did in confidence intervals. Remember, in confidence intervals, if sigma was known, we used a Z test. If sigma was unknown, we used a t-test. Same exact idea here. All right. We call z and t our standardized test statistic. All right. And that said, this video is getting a little bit long, so we're going to pick it up in the next video. So I will see you all there.